So welcome back to our afternoon session, which consists of two debates of each one and a half hours, um, in which we try to discuss the intertwinings between artistic research and institutions as well as uh, society. So not only to see amazing uh, concepts of artistic research processes as we already had, but to bring together protagonists from the field, even some that usually maybe w wouldn't frame themselves in the first sense as um, artistic researchers, but uh, which have such a critical um, artistic practice that we found it just important to invite them. Um, the first round is on the question how and to what extent and through which tools and with which consequences can artistic research practice be included in higher education or in scientific contexts? And we, well, in fact, you can imagine when three institutions or um, NGOs like the Artists Board of Saxony and the Academy of Fine Arts and of course um, the Technical University, when they come together to f create joint thematic boards, it's exciting and difficult in the same time because, um, of course, very different ideas of what topic to raise come together. So I hope we have a really exciting board of people now here together. And I want to ask you to welcome uh, Tal Adler, who is already ready over there. Just give him an applause. Antra Priede from our partner university in Riga in Latvia, over there. <laughs> Florian Kramer, who is already there over, uh, as well. <laughs> and I hope we will have, yeah, we have another discussion partner online via Zoom, Catherine Bihar from New York. So, welcome <laughs> also to her. And as we thought, usually um, it makes much more sense if discussion partners have the possibility to introduce themselves. Then, well, I, I will give some short information on the CV of the discussion partners as well, but the idea you get about people is from they, what they show you and what they can tell you about themselves. So we invited everybody, um, if they wanted to prepare a small presentation with some slides, um, and we will start with that, or with just a short statement of the, of the panel discussions, and um, I would say, let's start with you, Tal Adler. Just to um, say two or three sentences about you. You are an artist and researcher based at the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Collections, Karma, at the Humboldt University of Berlin. You have done various artistic research projects during the last years and you managed to have them funded, and you had different cooperation partners, be it the Austrian Science Fund, be it the um, Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, you were part of a Horizon 2020 project, which I find personally quite exciting because we are also a Horizon 2020 project with EU for Art Differences. And um, on your artistic background, I would just like to say you studied in Jerusalem at the Musrara School of Art, at the Sam Spiegel Film and Television School, and at Bezalel Academy of Art and Design, before you went to Vienna to Akademie der Bildenden Künste. And now I would invite you to say something about yourself, either from here, the other ones will come here because they need to um, deal with their presentation. So yeah, uh, thank you first very much for the invitation. 
Um, and this is a very, it's not even a presentation, it's just, just a very short uh, introduction to from what position I might be talking today in this panel. So it's not, a, it's a, and it's absolutely not a presentation of my artistic practice. This, what I usually do, I present my art projects, but here because of this uh, um, context, I uh, concentrate only on the infrastructure and politics of artistic research from the point of view of a practitioner. Yeah, so I'm, I'm talking as a person who has, in the last 12 years, um, been a beneficiary of uh, funding in the context of artistic research, and this is the, the position that I will maybe present. Um, so, but I did start in, in a place like this. I did grow up in uh, art uh, education institutions, in art academies and other art institutions in Israel. I studied and then I was working and teaching in many art institutions in, in uh, Israel. Um, and this, let's say, this first phase of 15 years of this kind of artistic career, um, first of all, my, my practice was exclusively political. It was part of, an, in a way, let's say, activist, uh, activist uh, structures and movements in Israel. And therefore, maybe it wasn't also part of an art market. Um, and what I was doing as this freelance artist, I was working in all these institutions and, and all kinds of jobs. And all the money that I earned went into my artistic uh, practice. And after 15 years, I kind of realized this is not really sustainable because uh, if, if the projects become even bigger, then I can't really finance them and of course no savings and pensions and so on. So as I said, I would concentrate on the questions of money and infrastructure in this talk. Um, so after around 15 years like that, call friends and colleagues of mine in Vienna uh, wrote me into a Fund, into an application, funding application. It was, it was around 2010. It was just w when the Austrian Science Fund, this is the FVF, when they started their uh, new channel of uh, funding artistic research. They called it the PIC program. They called it arts-based research. And I didn't know anything about artistic research. I honestly didn't really care. I only wanted to have the opportunity to continue doing what I'm doing and, and make a living out of it, especially as it is not art market uh, practice. And we were successful in obtaining this, uh, this, this funding. And for the first time, I, I received a salary for doing art work. This was, for me, mind-blowing. Um, and uh, then we were also the first project that applied successfully for another uh, funding, again, from the FAF. And so, in total, I was working at the Art Academy, doing my own projects with my colleagues and other researchers, other scientists, for around five years. And then again, the question of sustainability came up, um, because um, we, we realized that there was a kind of disappointment from the Art Academy. This is the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And when we spoke with the FAF, the people who give us the money, they were also disappointed because after five years, they, they invited us in. We were a, a model project. And they asked us, so do you now teach there? Do you work there? Do you get? And we said, no, no. And basically, they were also very disappointed because one of their goals in, in the defining their funding was to advance the career of the artistic researchers who are, who are getting these projects. And the Academy, the Fine Art Academy, was really, really happy for us. We were always um, successful in funding. It wasn't only FAF. We did all kinds of small funding. We got, we, we got in a lot of money, which the, universe, which the Academy, of course, takes overhead and so on, but they gave us very, very little. And as usual, these are two, three-year cycle of, of writing applications again and hoping to get some, some money to continue to live and work. And after five years, when we did the next application, we decided to go for a much bigger, the Horizon 2020. This is around a million and a half euro uh, that involves other uh, institutions in Europe. And at that time, I made a decision. I said, I absolutely don't want to write it again with the academy. So I want to include the academy. And we wrote it with other institutions and other universities throughout Europe. And luckily, we were successful again. We, we received this Horizon 2020. And this was, in a way, a Trojan horse. 
because we applied to a very non-art, uh, there was nothing about art in, the, in this call. It was about heritage, reflective societies, democratization of societies in Europe. But we wrote an application that really art is at the center, and we got the funding. We got the funding from, and then I, I found myself hired at the Humboldt University in Berlin. We moved to Berlin. Uh, and and the, 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 the contract says Wissenschaftliche uh, Mitarbeiter. So again, I was a researcher, but this time at a university. Um, and in this framework, I also coordinated the work of all the artistic teams that were spread over 10 European countries. Um, and this was a three year, three year cycle. But again, the question of sustainability, at the end of the three years, you have to, write, to, to think again what to do. You don't have, a, I, I didn't have any permanent uh, position at the university. And at the end of this uh, Horizon 2020, around 2019, um, my contract uh, was finished. But at the, exactly the same time, I was invited as an artist because of my expertise on, on the ethics of display and contentious collections and how museums deal with, with, for example, human remains in their collections and the display. I was invited by uh, an exhibition space at the Humboldt Forum, the Humboldt Labor. Uh, to intervene in, in I, won't, I won't go into the project now, you can look it up online. But uh, one of my conditions was, I told them, I'm very happy to work with you and to do the intervention and so on, but only if I, uh, I don't do it as a freelance artist. I already learned from the experience, I said, I want to be employed. So we kind of created again a position at Karma, at my, the research center that I did the Horizon 2020 there. And I was again employed at the university, this time from the core funding of our research institute in Karma. And um, this is now coming to an end. So this is very, um, and, and, and what I forgot to say is that at the end of the Horizon 2020, the first thing that happened was this new project and I employed myself again at the university. But the second thing is, as soon as uh, Horizon 2020 ended, I started talking about and lobbying for creating permanent positions for artists in research institutions, so universities, museums, and other, uh, and, and universities, museums, and other research institutions. And I'm talking about a permanent position. And I didn't even necessarily define it as artistic research. So for me, this is a bit less important how you define it, more important is how you do it. And I think by now, I and we are getting close to, to this creation of permanent positions in some, some universities, some museums in Europe. I'm still working on it. And this is currently what I'm doing. Uh, now, the, the core funding of Karma, this, this project that I did for the last three years, is finished. I'm employed again for, as a kind of a bridge uh, employment until a bigger project, which is 12 year hopefully will start, and in this framework, I will work um, as an artistic researcher, but also on a kind of a proper proposal, how to create, what does it mean for universities, museums, and other institutions to create posts, to create permanent posts, not this two-year cycle of, of getting third-party funding in the museums and the institutions and the universities. So I'll be happy to talk more later on about what exactly do I do and so on, but this was concentrating on the question of sustainability, which is money, basically. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tal. Um, now I would ask Antra Priede to talk to us, um, but first of all, let me introduce you. Uh, you're an artist and curator, graduated from the Academy of Art Academy of Latvia, our partner, Alliance Partner University from the Art History and Theory Department and receiving a bachelor and master degree. Um, since then, since the end of your studies, you have been a staff member of the Academy. Now you're vice rector for academic affairs. And in 2018, you uh, initiated and still manage the specialization of art history and theory department in terms of curatorial studies. 
So, um, you have been working at the Latvian Center for Contemporary Art as well, where you gained lots of knowledge about curating processes, and you, you also um, created and managed the Latvian art scene section of the Baltic Contemporary Art news portal, Echo Gone Wrong. I think I stop here and just give you the space. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so glad to be here, and thank you for uh, invitation to participate in this very interesting discussion. And when I was asked to prepare a five-minute uh, kind of presentation of myself, I started to go in my personal history, and here I just gather several aspects that has formed me as a person, and as a researcher, and as a, a practitioner in higher education system. And, uh, yeah, I don't know from which uh, point uh, to start, but I just want to focus on several aspects. Uh, as Dil was mentioning, I started to work at the Art Academy of Latvia already in my last bachelor year as a study methodologist, and it has been already 15 years as I'm part of uh, administration of Art Academy. Parallel to that, I was doing uh, art history research, uh, curatorial research, and I always felt that uh, something is missing in between these two uh, activities. And I would say that artistic practice, artistic research practice, or methods, disciplines, and variety of the way how to do it and organize uh, has led me to this personal understanding what I want to do as an individual in the broader context and what are the knowledge I would like to present not only in the academy but also for a wider public or in a public realm. So yeah, I, I was saying that art history was uh, not enough uh, for research. So then when I started to work at LCCA, we already touched upon several topics that are not maybe sometimes that, um, that academic and uh, sometimes ask un unpleasant questions towards women rights, gender rights, um, how, how we interpret uh, recent history. And that's also one of my topics I really like to uh, touch upon how to revisit history that we have been lived only in a recent uh, period. And the practice, what I always uh, want to do is yeah, basically project-based, and in the very uh, morning when there was a summary of the yesterday's presentations, I felt so such a warm feeling that these are the questions that are always circulating, and I'm not uh, away from the topicalities that were discussed um, yesterday. And um, as Abdil was mentioning, uh, four years ago I established a curatorial study program and uh, this year we will have the fifth intake and I would say that uh, each year is uh, quite a surprise or full of, of experiments as I still believe that curator is in the same shoes and as an artist dealing with creative uh, research processes, uh, formulating their thoughts and ideas and expressing it in a creative and artistic way. So therefore, there are several questions I uh, wrote down uh, yesterday, actually, because it was really hard to get the right points, what I want to present today. And uh, it is this, um, what is this behind the image? What are the processes? How we can get to the image? And an image, I don't think, as a a 2D image, but basically everything what we perceive in uh, everyday life and how our body is uh, interacting with this image, the feelings, the surprise, and what are the new knowledges that we can get out of our personal or uh, community experience through uh, curating and research work. And as I, yeah, coming back to the experience in academia, as I was saying, these are 15 years, and till now I haven't found a way how to connect artistic research experimental practices with uh, law, national law, European law, and uh, in a way I have found my own way in which I call poetry of bureaucracy, because there is always a way how we can uh, describe everything on paper, 
Of course, that not always uh, connects with actual process or the outcome, but as is everything processually based, I have this utopian idea that still through this poetry of bureaucracy, we can go further and I was, uh, yeah, and uh, as Mr. Butler was presenting, yeah, we have to have this kind of uh, courage uh, to uh, propose different ways, new possibilities, and yeah, they are always the ones that listen and try to help us. So yeah, this aspect of uh, courage is also one topicality that I would like to point out that uh, sometimes I see that we are still missing it. Yeah, and also, yeah, the, the question of what is academia is also currently on my mind already for quite a long time, and every year I try to revisit it, and maybe sometimes I get in a uh, dispute with my uh, academic colleagues, and then I always mingle around the question how to talk and change without hurting each other, because as you all know, who are involved in academia, everyday life, these um, discussions or... Uh, dramas, they occur quite often. Uh, I have to push it here. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, when I was uh, yesterday putting up this presentation, what, what has formed me as a person here and now, uh, I came back to this publication, Artistic Research Methodology, Narrative Power and Public, and these basically are two uh, main kind of uh, core fundamentals of myself, and each year I introduce them with my curatorial first-year students of MA program, Fail Again, Fail Better, and Democracy of Experiences. And the second part, Democracy of Experiences, was basically a description of a previous uh, slide. These are these uh, different um, experiences we all are having, and it doesn't mean that our lack of knowledge is something um, lower than somebody else's knowledge in some other disciplines. So not only for students, but also for myself, these are two topics that I have to repeat, repeat, repeat as a mantra for everyday life because we tend to forget it quite quickly. And the, the, same, the same goes uh, for the, this scheme that is also the very, very, very basics of artistic research, as most probably all you know, but th that's again, a, a mantra that I have to repeat to myself that there is always this aspect of uh, publicity and how through this public moment we can get uh, new knowledges and we have to do it and we don't have to be afraid to do it of the critique and other kind of yeah, talks around it. And these all methods, uh, yeah, as I was saying, I introduced with the curatorial first year students and uh, as this aspect of public activities is crucial in my understanding, and that's why I, I, I try to introduce to academia and also invite other colleagues to uh, take. And uh, as an example, yeah, there was an open call for last year, first year students, to prepare a proposal for an uh, exhibition that was submitted to our EU for Art project, and all colleagues of our four art, uh, art uh, academies chose the best one, and the proposal of the exhibition was realized. And that's the way how I like to work in academia, that it's always some kind of connection with uh, the world outside the walls of academy, because in my uh, study years I was feeling that I'm in some kind of chemical laboratory, and when I get out I don't know what to do. But uh, from the very first years we have to introduce our students with the actual processes of art. And to finish uh, this short presentation, here's an image of uh, Ukraine currently, which is attacked by Russia military forces. And this is an image of a toy that was left uh, behind a, a bomb a shell attack on, uh, on houses. And this image now is an inspiration for Ukrainian artists uh, to, to which I work together on an exhibition that we're going to open after two weeks in a public space. And uh, this is also a question that I always uh, ask myself while working with my own research or with the curatorial uh, students' research topics. 
uh, how we uh, f uh, formulate the source of inspiration and yeah, as there was this topic of uh, to, to divide or what is the differences between artistic research practices or practice-based artists' work. And there's, I think there's now like one proper uh, answer, but we have to always understand that our activism or to react on the site of the images of the processes in the world is also quite crucial and if we want to connect it with uh, artistic research practices we have to understand that always from these uh, activities or activism a new knowledge comes out and I believe that uh, if an artwork or a process gives new knowledge to a wider society that we can also count in as an artistic research practice. So, thank you. I'm, I'm sure we will ha have a really deep discussion during the next one hour at least. I don't have a watch. Um, but now let's come to Florian Kramer, who joined us from Rotterdam and who teaches there as a practice-oriented research professor in 21st century visual cultures at the Willem de Koning Academy. And which is an art and design school which is part of the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences. Yeah. <laughs> so please, the floor is yours. I'm not seeing my slide yet. I think, oh yeah, thanks. So there's a small cor cor uh, correction. Um, theoretically, I'm not even teaching. And this is one of the weirdnesses of, my, uh, of the Dutch system. Uh, is that if you have the position of a research professor in, in uh, art education or polytechnical uh, education, uh, you're not supposed to teach uh, unless we do it voluntarily. Yeah, uh, believe it or not. And we are the only people called professors. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a, a school of, with art school with 2,400 uh, students. And there are only three people called professors and they don't teach, yeah? theoretically, yes. And it's even more weird than that because I think if I give you a little bit of the institutional history and setting of the Dutch system, that also explains something about uh, yeah, parts of where the, the um, discourse of artistic research comes from, because you will see that a lot of people in the Netherlands have contributed to it. So um, this is the co complexity of my institutional embedding, because Wilm de Kooning Academy is on paper the art school with 2,400 students. Um, circa 2,300 on a bachelor level and 100 on the master level. Uh, and these are in the Pitzwart Institute, the master students. But really it's not a school, it's only a, a virtual school, but it's, it's part of the Rotterdam University of Applied Science. And I should say in, in German it would be a Fachhochschule, but I think it's even a little bit less than that. If I, I look what the Fachhochschulen uh, do in Germany, um, we, the, Fach, the equivalents, the so-called Hochschule in uh, the Netherlands, have a lot of study programs that actually would be just uh, vocational training, so Berufsausbildung in Germany, such as nurses, for example, or physiotherapists. Um, that is really the bread and butter of these schools. Um, so uh, our teachers then, I said they're not professors, um, so they're, you could translate their, their job functions as um, yeah, tutors, but what they really are, I have to translate it in, 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 into German, then you understand what it is, höhere Berufsschullehrer. That's, that's really our function. So, so um, the, the Polytechnics are not really Fachhochschule, but höhere Berufsschule um, with, with bachelor and master degrees, and our teachers are Berufsschullehrer on a, on a, on a higher education level. Huh? That's uh, for the Germans here to understand what, what, what I mean. So, um, and um, now, that means we do not have university status. Um, and uh, which le leads to a really uh, weird kind of schizophrenia that our bachelor degrees uh, are not recognized by the Dutch universities as equivalent. And although our bachelor uh, programs run four years and the university, uh, uh, Dutch university bachelors run three years, uh, students graduating from our schools have to do an extra pre-master year at the universities in order to be accepted into the uh, uh, university uh, master programs. Um, uh, I should also say that primarily we're a design school, and that's also quite typical of, of uh, the Netherlands. 
So um, of those 2,400 uh, uh, students we have, so actually the number is not right, I've just got an update on it, less than two, uh, 100 uh, study fine art on a bachelor and master uh, level. The rest on, for example, audiovisual design, graphic design, illustration, animation, even advertising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, and I said we barely have any professors. Well, before 2000, there were no professors at all, only teachers. Um, and the, the job function that I have and my two other colleagues at the Wurm de Kooning Academy is called Lector in Dutch, which, you know, it's, it's really wonderful because actually I found myself... Uh, 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 in, uh, in the Dutch, uh, sorry, in the German uh, national bibliography, uh, mentioned as uh, being a copy editor for a publishing house, because that, that is what, what lector means in, in German. So somebody there read my job description and they thought I'm at the copy editor in a publishing house. Okay. Um, but it is actually, uh, the, the job functions that we have is not ev even fully equivalent to that of university professors, but um, it's the equivalent of a junior professor in, in, in the German system or what uh, before the, you had the junior professor in which were introduced in, in the late 1990s, you had the so-called Akademische Räte, which were basically assistant professors on tenure jobs. That's, that's some, or the uh, job of the reader in the UK system. Uh, and what we are, um, the idea, what we do is that we do practice-oriented research. Um, so at our school, with 2,400 students, I said we have uh, three uh, professors, but, uh, but we're actually working part-time. So I've worked four days. In total, we have the two full-time equivalents. So it's like two full-time full uh, 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 jobs divided by three. Um, then, um, this is the kind of stuff that I do um, as, as a practice-oriented research professor. It's, uh, I work together with teachers and students um, to develop projects, for example, publications, symposia, um, work projects. Just We have been uh, with a small research group at uh, Documenta and actually also participating in Documenta 15's uh, 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 program to, in our case, function as, you could say, a kind of think tank for the whole school, but, but a collective think tank that, that hopefully involves, yeah, ideally, everyone at the school where we kind of think what, what is... Uh, art practice, what is art and design in the 21st century and how do we need, uh, need to adapt and renew and redefine our curricula in order not to kind of teach you know, what has been the art and design practice of the last century, which very often is a structural problem in, in, uh, 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 in, in art education. So uh, originally my research professorship was um, uh, defined as a new media professorship, so, so I looked at the impact of digital technology uh, uh, the internet in all art and design disciplines. That's why, for example, we, uh, we did projects on, on uh, electronic publishing. And then later, uh, my professorship shifted uh, to kind of redefining what... Uh, it's, it's something weird. Uh, in, in the Netherlands have adopted um, the concept of aesthetic autonomy that was de developed in German 18th and 19th century aesthetic philosophy, but turned it into something very practical, where um, basically the, the term for fine art or bildende Kunst in, in, in the Netherlands is autonomous uh, visual art. Um, and there's, there's a kind of division between art and design as being either applied or autonomous. Uh, and, and that's definition of autonomous is becoming quite problematic in many uh, respects uh, and uh, what my research group is uh, doing is to actually redefine autonomy and look at autonomy uh, and definition, we heard that uh, by the way today in many presentations, definitions and practices of autonomy in other areas of knowledge and reapplying them to, to, uh, 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 to art practice, which I think is, is pretty much the same or similar to what the Documenta 15 is doing. So I'm actually, I'm a Documenta 15 artist myself, one of, two, one, one of uh, one th more than 1,000, so, so that maybe shortens it. But now, I said that um, uh, there is a lot of theory production or discourse production uh, on artistic research in the Netherlands. Um, maybe you have, you're familiar with some of these books or authors, Henk Borchtow, for example, The Conflicts of the Faculties, um, uh, then um, 
uh, Henk Slager, uh, Janneke Wesseling, um, and there's also the infamous paper that I wrote myself uh, in, in response to the Vienna uh, Declaration on Artistic Research. Um, I think, well, there is something very simple to understand, and, and this is also why I came here to this uh, conference rather with a question than with an answer, is um, the Netherlands, we don't have any of that fluency between art schools or art practice and university research. It simply doesn't exist. Yeah? And we, we do have this status of höhere Berufsschulen. Uh, so artistic research is first and most of all a kind of vehicle to kind of shout at the Ministry of Education and say, give us research status. Yeah? Give, uh, uh, allow us to be more than than uh, uh, job trainings for nurses and, 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 and physiotherapists. Yeah? Um, um, uh, acknowledge that, that we are not just vocational practical uh, education. That's, that's what the uh, discourse on, on, on artistic research in, in, in the Netherlands primarily is, and artistic research then becomes the kind of token with which you claim that you're doing more than, than just... Um, uh, translating yeah, fundamental uh, uh, research into practical applications because that's the definition of what practice-based research is. The idea is, uh, for example, you have genetic uni uh, research at a university and then you have practice-based uh, uh, research that translates the insights of genetic research into new forms of, uh, for example, therapy. Yeah? And that's, of course, a model that doesn't work for us because it's not like that, let's say, um, um, humanities develop the fundamental knowledges that we apply as the arts. That's nonsense. Yeah? So, so it's, it's part really of an emancipation uh, struggle. Um, and, um, so, yeah, and that is my question, because you know, this is, I prepared this when, when I was still in Rotterdam, not in, in Dresden. Instead of the example on the left, I just could have taken a picture of what I saw yesterday at TU Dresden, where I saw, well, there's the artist residency at TU Dresden, and there's even the art collection at uh, TU Dresden. Or here's another example of um, a Helmholtz uh, uh, center inviting an audio artist uh, to contribute to a research project on acoustics. That stuff doesn't exist in the Netherlands. It's unthinkable. Uh, it's, it's even that the term research, you even have to fight in the Netherlands for anything that's not empirical, that's not either quantitative or qualitative research, to be even discussed as research. So, so uh, I think uh, that Germany has a certain advantage here, more fluency, which also comes from the kind of homo uh, uh, and humanist uh, tradition of research, which has a, where much broader definitions of research are yeah, not only existing, but also institutionally established and accepted. Yeah? Um, or if you're talking about PhD programs, well, we don't have them in the Netherlands. Uh, there's only one construction with a collaboration between uh, the art school in The Hague and University of Leiden, but where you could say this PhD program, I'm myself a supervisor there, a co-supervisor of two candidates, I would say it's mostly a program that trains visual artists to write theses about uh, research topics uh, 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 relevant in their own work. Uh, so it's, it's not really a practice-based uh, 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 project where uh, people actually uh, do their, their, their arts practice as, as a research practice. Uh, and, but when I look, for example, at the website here of KHM, or if I look at an institution like Bauhaus University Weimar, again, this doesn't exist. And I think that the Netherlands are not uh, alone in there, but that this, this, and Michael Hildbrunner would be the one to correct me here, uh, was a similar situation in, 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 in Switzerland, where there, I think there's also a kind of polytechnic university divides with the art schools and the polytechnic systems. And I think it was similar in Scandinavia until recently. Um, uh, basically also PhD programs in the arts in Scandinavia were being used as also a kind of tactical vehicle or Trojan horse to, to again, emancipate the, the, the art schools uh, into a, a more research and university-oriented system. Yeah, and that's it's, that's my <laughs> kind of background. So uh, the question is, you know, what what does Germany need to do? What doesn't already exist in in in, uh, in the system? Thanks. Thank you very much, Florian, for that insightful 
introduction of your work and your position within the academic system, um, which will raise, I'm quite sure, several questions later on. Now let's just welcome our last guest for this round, Catherine Bihar. We almost hope to have her here live, uh, but now you are here with us on Zoom, so very welcome, Catherine Bihar. Um, let me introduce you last, just in some short sentences. Um, you are an artist and researcher based in Brooklyn. You teach as an associate professor of new media arts at the City University of New York, um, where you serve as a deputy chair of art at CUNY's Baruch College and as a deputy director of the MS program in data analysis and visualization at the CUNY Graduate Center as well as a program coordinator of new media arts at Baruch College and as a director and curator at Baruch's new media art space, which already implies that you yourself as an artist have interdisciplinary approaches to art, artwork and use critical theory and relate to critical theory and feminism. You. Um, have a strong focus on digital cultures in context of gender, race, and labor. And now, please uh, tell us more about yourself. Okay, well, thank you so much. And first, let me just say, I'm so um, excited to be part of this conversation. And I can't believe that I'm not there with you because I already just from the conversations we've had so far, um, we've heard so far from folks, I have so many thoughts and I already want to change what I planned to, to, um, to present on. However, I'm going to start by sticking on script and I will share my screen and talk a little bit about myself and my work. And then I'm really looking forward to our discussion because I have thoughts and questions and uh, points of comparison for from all of the folks we've just heard from. So if you'll give me a moment, I'll turn on screen share. Um, and I'm also not going to be able to see the chat when I do this. So if anything is going wrong, somebody please turn on their mic and tell me it's not working. <laughs> okay, one moment now. Okay, so I think we should be good to go. Um, so to begin, I just want to, um, to say thank you again. And I want to start off by acknowledging that I probably have a slightly different approach to artistic research than many people there because I work in an American university and I was educated in the American system. So things are changing now, but when I did my degrees, there were hardly any art PhDs or practice-based PhD programs in the US. There are more now, but I think actually one of the things that we need to learn um, is learn from what's happening in Europe because we're at this sort of strange moment of, um, of growth of these programs in the US. Um, and even though there are more, there are still sort of um, fewer than there are in Europe or other parts of the world. So for my own experience, and I'm going to really try to keep this focused on my own practice here um, before we open up into the, these broader kind of institutional questions, I would just point out that structurally, my degrees ended up separating artistic practice and research. So I didn't, I had never even heard of artistic research when I was in school. Um, and basically in undergraduate and graduate school, I studied studio art. So I have fine arts degrees. I have a BFA and an MFA, which is still considered a terminal degree, at least for now in the US. And in between those two degrees, because I am somebody who likes theory, I also did a master's degree in media ecology. Um, so that was sort of where research started to come in. Um, but I'd love to, and I'd love to talk about this more in our conversation because I know that um, the education of people we've heard from is quite different from mine. But for my own part, I've come to appreciate that my education kept making and writing kind of de facto separated. And this separation continues to inform my practice today. So in thinking about what I would share with you, I thought about two main points. 
contamination through adjacency and non-expertise. And both of these relate to what I call writing art and making theory. So by contamination through adjacency, what I mean is that I tend to alternate between making and writing. And I really can only do one of those things at a time. It's just sort of how my brain is wired. I, can, I can't sort of do both in the same day or even the same week. I have to work on something materially and then work on something con conceptually with words. Even so, I often find out after the fact that my writing and making have kind of rubbed off on each other, generating insights in each area that surprise me and that I wouldn't have been able to summon through a more intentional or properly disciplinary approach. And by non-expertise, what I mean is that I have the privilege of operating more freely because I'm not burdened with a kind of specialized methodology in either area. So again, I write like an artist and I make like a theorist. Particularly in my theoretical writing, I sometimes realize in horror that I've put in print some totally outrageous, unsubstantiated claims by writing in this kind of uncensored way. And obviously, if I was a trained, credible, disciplinary theorist, this could be a pretty severe professional liability. But as an artist, it can be a bit different. I can take some risks with words. So I can strategically decide which hat to wear and when, and I can plead ignorance when inevitably I misstep. Plus, it often turns out later that I've made an artwork that I can offer as an example or some sort of proof, even if it comes after the fact. And I might discover that I've written art that supports the liberties I've taken making theory, or is it the other way around? So today I'd like to talk about that as actually a real strategy, a real method for what we're calling artistic research. And it's a method I find offers some freedom through non-expertise. And I'd like to share an example from my own artistic research practice. Anonymous Autonomous is an interactive robotic installation that transforms empty office chairs into driverless cars that roam an office-like open plan space as though it were a roadway. So this is a project that I'm currently working on and is hopefully nearing completion. Versions 1.0 and 3.0 were developed by working intimately with a team of art and engineering students at the University of Michigan, where I was, I guess what you'd call an artistic researcher in residence. And I was, you know, I, I really relate to what Tal was saying about trying to piece things together. And in the US, we really don't have, um, government funding. So I see myself as sort of a parasite on universities. My day job is my teaching job. And I'm just scouring for funding to find ways to build work. So um, there's really, CUNY does not support the kind of work that I make, and I'm going to other places like Michigan. So we were able to sort of cobble together a really interdisciplinary group of research units, including the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing, the Robotics Institute, and the Stamp School of Art and Design all sort of were hosting me in this project. And before diving in, I just note that the project and my residency both fall under a kind of broader research area um, of mine, which is what I'm calling artificial ignorance. And this is also something very much in progress. So I can talk more about it in the discussion, but in brief, Artificial Ignorance is a collaborative theory project that offers a kind of retronymic reassessment of AI tech by suggesting that ignorance in AI is a feature, not a bug. So I wager that intelligence has nothing at all to do with what's going on in AI technology, but rather AI produces ignorance in humans just as it simultaneously relies on ignorance in its technical systems for its core operations. And these insights are borne out in Anonymous Autonomous. So this project began as an exploration comparing automation in blue collar and white collar um, labor settings. And this image is from the first January 2018 proof of concept show at Robert Morris University. And this is a version 2.0 from a demo that we did in December 2019 at University of Michigan. And this is the most recent version 3.0 from a demo that we did in January at the Robotics Institute also at UM. So in brief, I'll just explain 
the chairs are like autonomous vehicles and that they have motors, computer vision systems, LIDAR sensors, and onboard computers. They have the basic intelligence to robotically navigate space by going forward when they see black in front of them and turning away when they see white entering a frame. They also have the intelligence to avoid collisions when something crosses their path. And in this version 3.0, they're networked so that if one of them gets trapped or stuck, they can call for help or the group can rebel in solidarity. Viewers lay sheets of white paper on the black floor, making lane markings that reroute the empty chairs. And this paper landscape evolves and it can often appear quite chaotic to the human eye, like a depopulated workspace that human office workers abandoned and left to disintegrate. But the chairs can still see the logic of the space and they obediently stay within the lines. So even as the neat lanes give way to scattered sheets of paper, they still slowly trudge along like despondent driverless vehicles. And I'll show a short video of the chairs in action. Okay, so I'm not really going to talk more about the content of this project. I wanted to explain how it works um, because I'll talk about the labor behind it. I'm happy to talk about content if there are questions, but for our purposes today, the important thing to note about this project is that I don't know how to build robots. So I'm working with this amazing team of mostly undergrad students at UM. And when we started, they also did not know how to build robots. So we were starting off from a place of ignorance. But critically, as we've worked, they now know how to build robots and I remain ignorant. And I bring this up because this is an inversion, just like artificial ignorance is an inversion of values and expectations in artificial intelligence. In this case, the inversion is also in the artistic research process. This is not how most artists approach a residency with students. A lot of artists would come in saying, I'm an expert as an artist with specialized intelligence and students are generalized free labor and they would have the students do all of the stupid, mindless, super time consuming, repetitive work that perhaps they don't want to do themselves. And I'm not throwing shade on this manner of working. In fact, I've done some of this in the past myself, but as it happens, we were doing the reverse with this particular project. So here are some photos of the process, and here's me meticulously hand painting, not one, not two, not three, but four coats of sealant, perfectly erasing the brush strokes on some of the hundreds of 3D printed parts hand dyed by me in the University of Michigan Fiber Art Studio Dye Kitchen. And here are some photos of our process showing Faye Kristoff, James Kennedy, Becca Cuomo, and missing in these photos are Karthik Erz and Ian Coart working on software and mechanical engineering. So you'll notice that I was the one doing all of the stupid, mindless, repetitive grunt work, and the students were the ones programming a simple but reasonably sophisticated AI to create actually autonomous robots. They are specialized as computer scientists and mechanical engineers, and what I do as an artist is much more general. So to me, this is why non-expertise in artistic research is critical, or it's one reason, because of course, besides mind-numbingly repetitive, unskilled tasks, the other part of what I do as an artist or artistic researcher is to create a situation where this kind of labor inversion can happen. So to conclude, as a non-PhD holding member of the professoriate, this is what I would warn the American system against as we are developing these programs within academia. This is what I worry 
that we could risk by institutionalizing artistic research through PhD-based education, because developing or adopting correct disciplinary research methods ultimately reinforces economies of expertise. So in pursuit of expertise, which by definition can only be verified by institutional consecration, there is a risk that art might lose its ability to confound reason or to surprise or especially to invert hierarchical systems of knowledge production. That is, art might lose its artfulness. So I had thought I would end there, but listening to these, um, these previous presentations, one of the things, and I'm especially picking up on the thread that Flor Florian left us with, um, one of the reasons that I think that this is so important is that, you know, ultimately the reason for PhD programs, the reason why American system, uh, university systems are developing more PhD programs is a culling of the herd. We produce too many MFA students for the number of jobs that are available. So we, you know, one of the main things that I try to do when I'm wearing, you know, just talked about my artistic practice, when I'm wearing my institutional hat, and again, I consider this a day job, it's really to try to create opportunities to elevate other people. I mean, that's the, the simplest way that I can put it. So I would prefer to have fewer barriers to entry to allow more people to do what I do, which is to be a parasite on the system. I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for this presentation. And now I really try to figure out how to start because uh, it's really for very different approaches to the main topic of the relation between artistic research and institutions. And maybe, um, yeah, one, one point uh, that Antra uh, Rose was the question, how do we formulate the source of inspiration? I think it was you, right? Um, and this is, this is, of course, it's not only about inspiration, it's not only about explaining that you are an artist, why you are an artist, but of course um, it's, a, it's a question of the context in which you discuss what you are wanting to do, planning to do, also doing. And um, we have four really different approaches to that. Tal, who talked about being a foreigner in scientific context. I hope it's not too rude to, to say, or maybe, no, maybe let's say, um, who tr locates himself in scientific contexts which are not automatically connected to artistic practice. Um, Florian, who um, in a academic context, which goes mostly for job education, tries to create free space for artistic research processes, or maybe, um, maybe firstly tries to go for research in the context of job education and then the artistic um, now yeah I don't I don't want to say too much wrong um, Catherine who um, on one side teaches on the other side cooperates in artistic research projects in other institutions so um, there's of course also the question to what extent what you do in cooperation with other academy or other other universities, can reflect back to what you teach your students in the in the Baruch College, and Antra, and you did not only um, start curatorial practices at your academy. You have a really brand new study program launched last year on um, artistic practice in theoretical contexts, and um, I don't exactly recall the name of, we, we were at the place uh, which you opened last year. Um, so, yeah, well, uh, Latvia, 
even has a doctoral school for artistic research from different uh, perspectives, music, fine arts and literature and video as well. Um, but this is of course a sort of uh, relatively new program that tries to um, to shape itself in in these days during uh, through the process. So, um, well, how to communicate to the others your artistic research viewpoint, maybe in in strange contexts. I would like to ask you first, Tal. Yeah, very good question. <clears throat> and I was thinking about it a little bit while you were uh, phrasing it. Um, again, comparing my five years, let's say, at the Art Academy and uh, five years at the university in Humboldt. And it's really, really interesting to see because at the Art Academy, we worked on many projects, actually, very intensive, and there were a few other research, uh, artistic research projects neighboring us, but there was never any kind of real um, collaboration, uh, mutual inspiration. There, there was almost no, and I think it comes from the, the kind of artistic practice that people are used to having their own studio practice, this more personal and so on. And it became very clear to me only when I started to work at the, at the Humboldt University. So I was part of a new research center for, uh, that, that does, you know, museology and heritage studies. And I was the only artist there. Um, and there were a lot of anthropologists and other people from the humanities and social studies and so on. And there was so much uh, mutual inspiration. Uh, they, there was a lot of collaboration. Um, some of what I did ended up in their texts and in their research. Of course, what they did ended up very much you know, inspiring me and teaching me and so on. So of course, in the beginning, I felt a little bit like a foreigner. You know, I mean, as an artist, I'm used to, to come and talk about the work. And, and then there is much more question of publications and, and, and conferences and stuff like that. But in the end, I have to say that, that, that uh, in this in this specific academic environment where I am now, maybe because of the structure of, of having weekly research meetings where many different you know, researchers present their stuff and talk about it, um, I feel even more comfortable than I felt at the, you know, at the heart of art, at the art academy. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, so, so, and also because of the way I work, I work uh, very much collectively, I work I interview people and I integrate the interviews into my art practice and I work very much on, on, on problems within institutions. So for example, museums and cultural heritage institutions. So I work with the institutions and I work over a long period of time. So these kind of relationships and working dialogically and working on relationships is very, very important for me. And that's why I think the academic structure is very good for this kind of work. First of all, this academic affiliation that I have opens doors for me. I can approach other scientists and researchers, research institutes everywhere, and they see me as a colleague, as an eye-to-eye, -eye, you know, no hierarchy colleague, and I can go in, use facilities, interview, and so on. Um, and then also producing stuff together. Um, this really enables having a transdisciplinary settings to produce things together, which, which we actually did. So maybe later on, I can talk a little bit about the Traces project and what we did in these multi and transdisciplinary teams. But yeah, this is about the inspiration question. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to go back to Florian, um, who explained uh, quite intensely about the uh, educational political situation of the um, academy you are involved in and I just wonder um, if the term of artistic research in a context which is very well um, goal-oriented in training people with a certain focus on job education how do you um, 
locate artistic research in such a framework and how you, do you uh, communicate it? Um, this doesn't work, oh, this works. Um, I think, you know, if, if I'm very blunt, I would say uh, they're opposite goals uh, mm -hmm. and often it's also conflict between, let's say, student and teachers and management. Um, of course, for students and t teachers, you want to create, uh, you want to use research also as experimental uh, trajectories and opening up uh, spaces that very often are, do not exist in this very streamlined uh, uh, art education, particularly on the bachelor level. For management, often, to say it also a little bit more, even more bluntly, um, in, in the Netherlands, there's a feeling that um, Basically, uh, art is something looking for a new business model. Yeah? Um, there were two big cuts uh, in, in the Dutch funding systems, and, and uh, the Netherlands is a country that both in its population and its, its area is almost exactly as big as Nordrhein-Westfalen, the, 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 the German state, Nordrhein-Westphalia, um, but it has 12 art schools. Everyone knows it's too many art schools. Everyone knows it's too many students. And I would say, sorry, a little bit cynically again, uh, the, the school managements, they just pick every straw they can get. Doesn't matter if it's called creative industries or if it's called artistic research, if it, if it uh, uh, somehow creates new job opportunities or at least a narrative for, for, for justification of, of the continued existence of the school in this scale, they, they grab it. And maybe in five years it's going to be something else. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit cynical here. But what I would be if I... I'm not cynical. Um, um, I would have one curious question to all three of you. What really, you know, yesterday we had the presentation by Michael Hildbrunner where he talked about the FNF school in Switzerland as, you could say, an experimental artistic research school. And maybe that's the kind of ideal that we're striving for. Maybe these are the kind of schools we really want to create then also and, and than under the name of artistic research. Um, the interesting thing about FNF was it didn't have any degrees. It didn't even have bachelor degrees, uh, but only, so it's like almost the opposite thing, yeah? Um, instead of going, f even scaling up the degrees and going for the highest degree like the PhD, uh, the opposite thing is let's get rid of those degrees at all. And I'm very sympathetic to that. I mean, I myself, I got my PhD because I, in, in, in university humanities, because it was my only opportunity to continue working there. Uh, otherwise, you're out. If uh, you, in, in, in the German system, you can work five years without a PhD, uh, and if you haven't got it, you, you, you won't get a job anymore, right? So, so it's just, just like, if you're a medical doctor and you want to, to practitioner as a medical doctor, you need to have that doctor degree. There's no question about that, right? Um, so, uh, and my curious question of to all three of you is, since you, you have done research projects also with funding, you know, um, did you need the doctor title um, on the funding application? Because that's, I mean, this is how I can also, I would say it's my mo the most practical justification I have for PhDs in the arts where I say they're necessary. I also say it to my students, if you want to develop your own research project, if you want to, in our case, submit your application to the Dutch Research Council, council you have no chance without that uh, doctor degree. Uh, 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 you, you simply cannot sign it. Uh, uh, or you have to look for somebody else to sign it for you, but then you're no longer, then it's no longer your project. Um, so this, this is for me a very practical and, and, and meaningful justification for PhD in the arts, but I would be curious about your ex uh, experience whether you also found that the PhD title is really necessary to, 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 to get research funding for your own projects. Well, um, as far as I remember, Catherine, you said that you're really uh, uh, skeptical about installing institutionalizing PhD titles. So that sounds as if you, uh, without a title, found possibilities for big, large-scale projects to be done and to be realized um, without needing that title. Maybe you would like to, to answer directly to Florian. Sure, yes. I mean, I, to be clear, I think I'm, I think this is generational. I think I'm the last generation that will, in the U.S., that will have the opportunity to have um, 
full-time jobs and to have, um, you know, funding opportunities without requiring, um, you know, without requiring a PhD. But I think this is also because the funding um, structure is different in the U.S. I mean, basically in the U.S., there is no government funding. <laughs> so we don't, it's, it's most of the funding for art projects um, comes through private institutions. And, you know, this is why for, for someone like me, I think the PhD, I do worry about the institutionalization of, uh, for me, I think the PhD is exactly what, um, what Florian is talking about. It is a qualification that opens a door, you know, and I would like to see fewer barriers to entry. So, you know, I think that we, you know, um, so basically for me in my life, um, I don't make art that is uh, readily sellable, right? You know, the, the main, I live in New York City. It's a very art market gallery based art world, you know, in New York City. And I don't have gallery representation. And I've never really pursued gallery representation because I want to make the kind of work I make and I found that a teaching job was for me like the last the last thing without the kinds of grants that are available in Europe. The teaching job for me was kind of like um, like a renaissance, like patron of the arts kind of thing. Like I get to draw a salary. I have a retirement plan. I get to do something which I like doing, which is working with students. But I also have you know, I get to call what I do research in order to get funding either through my institution, which is, you know, very poor. I teach at a, um, at a public university in the city and we are chronically underfunded. So it's a, it's a chronic state of scarcity where I teach, but I can also make my work legible to other universities that are better funded, such as University of Michigan, and I can fund projects that way. But I haven't needed a, a um, I haven't needed a PhD because I ha I already have the title of a, of being part of the professoriate. You know, I I was able to get that get hired into an assistant tenure track line with only an MFA, and I'm the last generation that I think will have that opportunity. Thank you so so much for that statement. Of course, um, this is a discussion which is a hot topic in Germany because. Uh, in Germany, you still don't have the need of a PhD or doctoral degree within the uh, context of fine arts academies to become a professor. And this is, of course, something which is highly debated because on one side, it allows to, uh, to invite very well-known artists with a high... Um, public perception and with a large inspiring block of works, but maybe without any teaching experience, um, which then might or might not become a problem, of course. Um, well, but but here we, we still, um, well, we discuss in to what extent a degree is the sign you you need to to prove that you are able to teach students and to share your knowledge and experience. Of course, in, in the field of artistic research, it's a little bit more tricky because um, to be involved in research discourses, of course, also um, needs, to, uh, needs a lot of experience which goes beyond pu pure artistic practice, right? So... Um, this is even even another field, but um, I would I would ask Antra from her perspective in the in the core and in the heart of the LMA uh, University in Latvia. What we heard about the difficulty of too many students leaving academy and an art market which is narrow, and the question. To what extent do you need titles, and how to how do you position yourself as an artist in the field of 
different possibilities of, of jobs. Um, how do you train students to be able, let's say, to uh, be ready for as many possibilities as, or as many, as many approaches to artistic practice as possible after the, the master or after the PhD? Is there uh, yeah, a general agenda you follow? Yeah, I would say yes, there is agenda, but I wanted to come back to your question and maybe somehow to link uh, you your both uh, questions. Yes, of course there is a need to have a PhD and uh, also commenting this uh, new policy of our education uh, policy, we are yeah, now forced to uh, sto show statistics how many of our professors are holding the PhD position and by the end of uh, this year we have to prove that we have already, if I'm not wrong, 20% of current staff and after two years 40% of our uh, staff should be holding a PhD position and therefore and that's why we are having this uh, practical PhD program, which we hopefully will uh, secure the numbers of PhDs. So on one hand, it's kind of artificial uh, procedure or process that we are forced into, but there are those positive aspects that come out of it, and that connects maybe your uh, answer to your question, that through this uh, third cycle practical PhD program, we can ensure uh, artistic practice to be implemented in a professional way by inviting professors, showing experience, helping students to realize their public activities. Because as I was saying, uh, I see that this uh, act of publicness or act of possible dialogue with a visitor, with a um, your neighbor, I don't know, with the exhibition workers is the first step to uh, your profession or your being as an artist. And I forgot to mention that I also established a new institute at our academy last year. It's called the Institute for Contemporary Art, Design and Architecture because uh, there's a architecture program in development. And um, also connecting uh, an answer from your question is that yes, there are those needs of PhDs but then I switched this uh, mode of uh, poetry of bureaucracy because to apply or to so secure our participation in uh, research funding, I can uh, figure out how to do it with the requirements of PhDs. And it doesn't mean that I have to invite somebody just uh, for, for the paper, but there are a lot of young people that are too afraid to be the first ones that steps out to the research. So. Yeah, I have the at least the power, bureaucratical power, <laughs> to invite. So there's uh, this connection with some uh, moving forward and this magnet that also attracts uh, young professionals. And but uh, in our academy, that's still in the process and development. But we have to be just courageous to do something different than what we are asked for. Thank you very much. Um, I just saw one question, I think, from the public. John, did you want to say? Did you want to ask something? Thank you. <laughs> all right, I'll lean forward. Thank you very much for all the speakers, and thank you, Catherine, for joining us. It's great you're here with us. Now, I mean, research, PhD, doctoral level, has been around a long time. It's not in the arts so much, but don't we owe it to our students to have the opportunity to continue their study? Art schools have kind of had the notion of the discipline of practice as a tradition is changing radically. It's changed radically for a while, a long time. But in a way, the institutes now to have to find ways to increase or develop their teaching and learning. And I think it's the responsibilities of academies to actually offer the third cycle for those students who want to actually continue developing their learning in a specific way, alongside whether it's their practice, not necessarily as co I, I quite agree with Catherine that we have to be careful of how we do it. And I know 
we're very conscious. I mean, I've come from the UK, so I'm terrible. But is that they actually, the notion that a PhD is necessary to teach an academy is a false notion. It, it is appropriate in certain circumstances. It's not necessary in most circumstances. So I would be anxious that we don't um, find a situation where it becomes compulsory to teach in higher education. But it is important that students have the opportunity to continue their study. The biggest growth in funding in all uh, levels is in higher education, is in research. The access to that research funding should be the right of every, every subject, every discipline in, in higher education. It isn't the case. I think that uh, we, we should, I mean, uh, Florian uh, was saying about re research professors. In the UK, I mean, and they've had professors, but in the universities, the prof there's only one or two professors in most departments, and they're the heads of research normally. That's their title by um, what their responsibility is. But the other staff are expected to be research active, and the title is very much very particular. It's very... You know, it's a hierarchical situation. They do teach. I mean, of course, we supervise and go uh, and do things like that. Um, but and, and I had to go through a rigorous procedure to get a professorship. It wasn't just by right of being in a in a certain position. So I think you know, but we do. It's the responsibility of the universities to give, or the the arts academies to give that level of study to the students who want to continue, because the practices, and it does facilitate a lot more variation in the practices of collaborative, transdisciplinary, trans, uh, et cetera. And I think we've got to be careful that we don't, and it will be interesting, Catherine, that you're, you're not training technicians, but you're training people who are using, gaining skills bases to actually, for their own career development. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, a question to the audience, uh, because we are already approaching the time frame for this uh, discussion. Would you allow us to have 10 minutes more and sh uh, shorten the break uh, to, to 20 minutes? And then it's, it's already 10 minutes more. Oh, okay. okay. Um, that's that's hard. So, do you give us five more minutes, and then we have a fifteen minutes break? Would that be okay? <laughs> um, because there are two two questions I would really like to ask uh, to Florian and to Tal, and um, it's two very different questions. So, I do, I think we could talk about it two hours more. Um, but first, because we are talking about institutional. Uh, possibilities to give PhDs to, to artists. There's, of course, also um, that's an issue in the framework of European higher education. And um, we are all working a lot towards um, making visible that what we do is relevant and that it uh, is appreciated not only by the artists but also by the scientific context and uh, so of course there are schools of artistic research that have developed and um, we have strong discuss discussions about how to uh, communicate artistic research towards the European Committee and towards the international science community um, this was the Vienna Declaration last, which you already mentioned, John. And Florian um, came to a really broad public through a criticism of the Vienna Declaration. Um, I would, because I think not everybody knows it. So it, it would be too much to, uh, to discuss it to the broad, but if you can, could just phrase, I don't know, with two or three sentences, your main concern about it, and then we would go to Tal. No, I, I think the, the easiest thing also to cut it short is maybe, you know, you can Google Vienna Declaration okay. on Artistic Research and, and read it yourself. It's, it's a two pages uh, document. And basically the um, argument I put down with Nienke Terpsma from the Fucking Good Art Collective, which I just learned was also a resident here in Dresden, um, is that this, uh, uh, declaration 
is so much removed and so alienated from the language of the arts that uh, you're really risking uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, even if this is a policy document and if it, even it is, speaks at policy makers and basically is, is a kind of hack to, 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 to bring uh, art into the research system. I think it's maybe similar to the question that we just had on the PhD. I think, I think you know, um, Maybe we have to be pragmatic and think, think of ideal and less ideal but still necessary steps. Uh, maybe the ideal uh, situation from my point of view would, have, would be to have no degrees at all. And not only in art education but in universities, etc., etc. And basically to say degrees are bullshit. There, there should be opportunity for people to study, for people to research, but uh, to, to have it these, these kind of labels attached is rather stupid, but this is utopian thinking. We will not get there anytime soon, and in the meantime, of course, yeah, uh, we cannot keep other people down only because they're artists that are not getting the same opportunities. There, I'm totally uh, agreeing with John. And then the question is, you know, which kind of dirty work do you need to do um, uh, in order to make this happen? There, I also even understand where the, the Vienna Declaration is coming from. So this, this is, I, I know, I know what the let's say the good motives are. I only question, you know, how much do we need to kind of sell out in order to reach that goal? Yeah, that's and that's that. I think that conflict will stay. So, so, you know, where do we find the right balance between idealism and pragmatism in this, in this story? Yeah, thanks for just um, bringing that to a point which is also highly relevant for our project because <laughs> what we try to do is to create something which can be a structure for artistic research in the context context of this art academy and of course we have to deal with the experiences and the expectations and the frameworks so um, and also with our uh, helplessness towards uh, the language of the European Commission in some some ways so so it's a collective training also in discussion with the EU uh, which is quite exciting by the way but uh, also difficult so um, I think that's really something we have to be aware of in general how to create something which um, fits to frameworks without becoming a slave of the frameworks um, and now just how because you mentioned your traces project and I have to admit that I don't have, in, have details in mind, but I suppose it might be just a best practice example to give to the auditorium before we finish the discussion. So would you like to say something about it? Yeah, thanks. So first of all, it's not a best practice example, but, uh, but I'll give it as a not best practice example. I mean, it is in some things, but, but in, in our uh, context now and the question that you asked, it's really a, a brilliant question about do I need a PhD to run? And as I kind of tried to hint before in my talk, I think most of my effort now is to com come up with tricks how to go around the fact that I don't have a PhD. So I don't have a PhD, right? And I've been able to kind of pull all kinds of tricks to, to, to stay and have a salary at an uh, academic institution, but it's getting harder and harder. So to be honest, what the advice that you give to your students is a great advice for them. But I also agree 100% with what you wrote at this great text, What is Wrong with the Vienna Declaration, that it's also very dangerous. So, by the way, it's a great text that I recommend anyone to read it. And I will also use it when I negotiate with our university and maybe the other institutions that are open to hear about it, why the positions that I want to create, also for the, 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 the younger generation here, why it's important to be able to, to have a possibility of without a PhD. And I'm building on the precedence of the art academies in Europe that you can be a professor without a PhD, which is probably it's going to go away sometime soon, and this is what I mean dangerous. That's why your text is great. So with the TRACES, so TRACES is an acronym for transmitting contentious heritage through the arts or with the arts, from intervention to co-production. So, and, and this is a good example why it's hard without a PhD and so on, because it, it is based on a concept that I developed as an artist working at the academy, 
which is a kind of a collaborative work between artists, researchers, and institutions of cultural heritage or problematic cultural heritage. Um, when I say problematic cultural heritage, I mean in the context of national social collections, for example, from national socialism or colonialism, genocide, scientific racism, difficult collections, right? And, and groups of artists, researchers, and those institutions coming together, working together for a long time, developing uh, collaborative artistic and research processes, and then publishing them or exhibiting and so on. And because I didn't have a PhD, I had to, we had to take <laughs> or engage, uh, when we wrote the application, also um, people with, uh, so, so professors and institutions, education institutions, in order to impress the EU who evaluates this, uh, this application. And I had to, so in a way, I was practically, I was a PI, principal investigator, but we had to take another person who had a PhD to be officially the PI, which is an absurd, and it's painful, but you know, this, this is what I said, this, this kind of trick, so this is why it's a very good question about the PhD. And that's also why I'm trying to, to still cling to this, this, this uh, model here in Europe that you can, you can do research and professorship without a PhD. Um, yeah, and, and uh, regarding this, this, this model that we created in the traces, uh, you can look it up. It's called the CCP, Creative Co-Production. It's, um, you can find it on my academia, you know, this academia.edu website. There's, I have a page there with a few texts, and there's a text about the CCP model and some other texts from the Traces project. Um, yeah, but, but I do feel that it's going to be more and more difficult to navigate in this world, in this production, in, in this, this kind of field without a PhD, which is for, for me, it's a pity because me, for example, I have, you know, I, I have, for example, some cognitive <laughs> uh, barriers to obtaining a normal PG. I could only do it through these kind of programs of um, uh, PhD in practice and so on. And I guess there are a few more other people like me who enjoy working within the academic infrastructure of collaboration, inspiration, and so on, but will be barred away from this opportunity. Yeah. Can I maybe sorry, make one uh, footnote? It's not only a problem for the practicing arts. I, uh, look at the German humanities. Um, you know, uh, who has been failed by the German university system never got their terminal professorial degrees. The greatest intellectual of these countries, Walter Benjamin, Hannah Arendt, and uh, uh, a really uh, contemporary example, Dietrich Dirksen, he doesn't even have a bachelor's degree. In the past, they were all saved by, by the media. They could, could uh, survive as essayists and journalists, all three, three of them. But we know, since the media change is no longer possible, and somebody like Dietrichsen went from becoming a journalist to, to an art school professor. It would be a fucking shame if this, this, this opportunity would uh, uh, be destroyed. So... Yeah, so that was a fi great final <laughs> sentence. <laughs> uh, let's keep, really, let's keep the chances open and try to develop additional chances to provide as many possibilities as available. Thank you so much. Thank you.